What's good, South Jersey? I'm in the city of Burlington where I had the pleasure of sitting down with Ricardo Dale of Free All Minds Nonprofit. And there's just not enough that I can say about this brother. I mean, whether it's Free All Minds is nonprofit to becoming the councilman of the city he grew up in, Beverly. I'm just glad he had time in his schedule to sit down with what's good so we could talk about all the positive things that he's doing and what's to come. He is definitely what's good in South Jersey. My first question to you is, describe to me how you were as a kid. I'm talking like seven, eight, elementary school. Describe the type of kid and student that you were. In elementary school, I was kind of a guy that's like, kind of like the funny guy, like jokester. That's what a lot of um, my teachers and my friends see me as. I was often acting out. And looking back, I think one of the main reasons that I was that guy that's like had to be the center of attention and was always acting out is because of, you know, the the lack of attention that I really got elsewhere. So I kind of, I wanted to, I yearned for a sense of being recognized. And I think that's something that I was, I seeked in school and that's like played a big part in like the reason why I acted out the way that I did. So I was often like in trouble for doing like little things like just making, making noises in class, maybe like throwing stuff at like my friends, like stuff that like kids do. You got in trouble, but, I, I find that hard to believe. <laughs> yeah, bro, like o oftentimes like getting in trouble, like e even suspensions in like middle schools for like petty fights or like just doing like dumb stuff, like throwing food, like in the caf cafeteria, I got suspended for throwing pudding on my brother <laughs> in like sixth, sixth or seventh grade. And it's like oftentimes just acting out with no sense of direction because I really felt like I wasn't heard at home and at school. I just felt like um, I, wasn't, I wasn't really understood. How about you performing like academic? Were you getting like straight A's or were you getting A and B's? Um, middle school, I, did, I was probably a C student. You know, it's middle school, elementary school. It's the same thing in Beverly. From K to um, eighth grade is the same school. It's such a small school. So throughout my time in Beverly, I was probably a C student. It was, it's extremely hard for you to fail in like elementary and middle school. So I wouldn't say I was a good student, but I got by just by, you know, being there kind of and like doing the bare minimum C. Sometimes um, I think I had like one semester where I was like honor roll mentioned. I was like A's, I think B's, A's and B's in like one C. That was probably my um, proudest moment in like elementary school, okay. middle school. <laughs> But I still didn't like make honor roll, but I was like almost there. It was like we, I got like honor roll mention certificate. So when you went to school, what was this? What, this you said middle school, right? Yeah. In middle school, was there anyone who that was on that staff give you any attention? Any uh, anything? Did you have outlets? Did you have like extra activities? So I had a I had a basketball coach, uh, Coach Dempster, who played a major part in my life at, at that young age. You know, I. I felt like he definitely instilled a lot of confidence in me. He he believed in me and his just belief in me overall made me more confident in the things that I did. Mm -hmm. It kind of started on, on the basketball court where I was a young player that was always questioning my decisions. He kind of pushed me to really have confidence in the decisions I made. And it kind of carried out into the classroom and other things that I did. It definitely made me a little bit more confident as a person and as like the person I was growing into to be a young man. And um, your position, played a part. by the way, what was that on the Point guard, court? shooting guard. I was always small, so it's like you really can't play many other positions Rate outside yourself. of a guard. Rate yourself. So. How were you uh, when you were on the court? Um. Don't be modest. Don't don't. No, like you. I was. <laughs> I was all right. Like you know, I played. I played, but I wasn't like a starter in um, elementary school, middle school. I wasn't starter. I wouldn't say I was a great player. I had great ability, but I think. Mentally, I was, um, I just didn't play very smart. Like I was always overthinking. I was such an overthinker really? that I thought myself out of the game. Mm -hmm. And that was like one of the biggest things for me to overcome. So I think that played a big factor. And like, me, I, I definitely wasn't a great player, but I was a hard worker. And I definitely think that kept me around, but. Got you. Yeah, definitely. that's, <laughs> work ethic is really important. Yeah, that kept me around, but that definitely basketball, I would say played a, a major a major factor in my life, a major factor in my overall growth. And I would honestly say that it changed my life and it made me who I am today. And it might sound like crazy, like a basketball, like a game. How, how can that change my life? Mm -hmm. But without basketball, I don't know if I would be here today. 
So personally, I don't I don't smoke and I don't drink. And I saw a lot of people in my family growing up um, struggling with addictions. So that was one of the factors why I don't smoke and I don't drink. But also one of the major factors for me not smoking and drinking was ba my love for basketball. I thought I was going to go to the NBA. I thought this was going to be my life. And I told myself that I can't smoke and I can't drink because it's going to distract me from like going to the NBA. Like when I was a little kid and I saw my friends like a after school, like doing crazy stuff, like smoking and doing these things that like young teens start to do. My my reason and my excuse always was nah, bro. Like I like it's not good for me. It's going to mess up my lungs like I'm trying to play ball. Like this right. is what I'm focusing on. Right. And I kind of used that as a thing to keep me from doing anything negative when everybody's like out on the streets or they're like goofing off after school, I'm right in the gym and I'm spending every one of my hours every day, five to six days a week, at least sometimes seven days a week in the gym from middle school until my senior year in high school. And but it really started in middle school where I really started to find that love for the sport. And I really think it saved my life because it took me from even having the opportunity to do the wrong thing. It took me from even having the opportunity to be in the streets because I'm spending all day in the gym. I don't even get into get the chance to run into any trouble. And I think it changed my life. I wanted to ask you too, who was pouring into you through those like pivotal years? Because you said that you were mostly in the gym from like middle school all the way to your senior year of high school, stuff like that. In between time when you weren't in the gym, who kept you accountable to stay away from all of those things that all the other friends of yours and your peers were getting into? Um, for, for a large um, part of middle school, it was uh, my stepfather. He was a major um, factor in my life. My freshman year in high school, he went to prison and he passed away in prison. And that same year, I finished that school year with a 0 0.8 GPA and was one of the lowest years of, of my life. I really didn't I really had no sense of direction. I had no want to do more. I had a very little care for other people and even myself at that time. You know, I found myself in a position where I was really lost. My mother was struggling with an addiction and I just kind of felt alone in a world that was kind of so, so, so toxic and wishy-washy. Like I didn't, I didn't understand, you know, why like, I was in this position and why my life was this way because it hurt to see my mother struggling it hurt that i lost a, the one father figure that i had and i was really just like young trying to make sense of it all and i'm like why why like why is my life this way and i kind of went down the, um the wrong path continued to goof off in school my sophomore year didn't really do much better academically i was still i was still playing sports i was still that was a driving factor that was helping me but I started to lose interest in that a little bit as well. And by my junior by my junior year, I literally had no idea what I was going going to do with my life. And I I knew like college wasn't even an option for me. I knew that I didn't really have any other options outside of college. So I kind of just felt stuck. And around that time was when I really was beginning to get extremely close with a mentor of mine. His name is Coach O. I met him my sophomore year, but around my junior year, which was like a really pivotal point, is when I, like, we were like, that was like my guy. Like, I looked at him like almost like a big brother by that point, like he was family. And at that time, it was just being around him that made me start to see, you know, something different. He was running his own nonprofit organization and he's helping all, all these kids that are coming from low income environments are coming from these rough households. And I saw that and I and like, I was amazed by it. I looked at him like, like a hero almost. And I wanted to, I wanted to be that. And I think that's really what sparked my transition and my change. Not me wanting to kind of help myself and get myself out of the situation I was in, but I wanted to be like Coach O. I wanted to be the person that helped other people out of their tough situations. I wanted to be a hero. I wanted somebody to look at me the way that I looked at him. Like, wow, like this guy is changing lives. He's saving people's lives. I wanted to be the guy to change people's lives. I wanted to impact people's lives. Definitely. And I, um, I ended up leaving my first high school. I felt as though 
I, there's nothing there's nothing I could do there academically I was um I wasn't doing well I had no sense of direction it was a trade school and I was in a shop that I didn't even want to be in so um when I when I left that school I wasn't really sure what was next for me but it's like you have to go to high school still sure. and yeah. um I was lucky lucky enough to um get in contact with administration and a basketball coach at Doan Academy where I was able to talk to them and after telling my story and my want for just doing more, they took a chance on me and accepted me into Doan Academy, but I had to stay back a year because of my grades and I wouldn't have had, I wouldn't have met the requirements to um, have attended the school at the time with my current grades and my current, current test scores because of how poorly I did academically for the year, for the um, prior year, so I decided that I was going to take that opportunity. And I went to Doan Academy. I stayed back a year. I became, and I became a sophomore. At that time, I also was dealing with a lot of things at home and it was just not a, a safe environment for me to be in. I was often like spending nights at like friends' houses and out the house a lot and just trying to remove myself from, you know, that environment that I grew up in. So I ended up moving t with a friend named Elijah and his family to Pettis's. Moving in with them was another transitional period in my life because they just showed me something different. It's just something about an environment where you're expected to excel that just has an effect on you without somebody even having to tell you what to do. Without them telling me, Ricardo, you're gonna go to college, the fact that they have three sons and all their sons were expected to go to college. All their sons were expected to do well academically. It had an effect on me naturally to just be in that space. You know, they say, if you hang around with five millionaires, like you're gonna be the six. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the environment that I was brought into with the Pettises, with the level of ex excellence that they kind of just expected in their household, I kind of became a part of it. Let's go from there to your transition into college. Yeah. Because at this point, when you're filling out the applications and you're, you know, going out for different schools and stuff like that, you said your, your GPA at the time was like a 0.8, like it was really low, right? By the end of my senior year, I knew I cannot afford n not one of the schools that I've applied to. So I haven't been accepted to any school that I can go to. So by the end of my senior year, in my head, I'm thinking college might not be a thing. Wow. So I'm like, what, what am I gonna do next? I had a conversation with a mentor of mine and her name is Kelly Dunn. And she kind of asked me like, what, what is it that you want to do with your life? And I'm like, I just want to help people. I just want to do all I can to, you know, make sure that somebody doesn't feel as though they don't have the opportunity to be who they want to be in life. And she's like, I think I have an opportunity for you. She gets on the phone and she's like, yeah, there's this mentor called first. There's this mentor program called Four Star Academy. You would live with the students for a month. They actually already started the program. It's a, it's about two days in right now, but they're still looking for they're still looking for mentors. Would you be willing to work work for them? And I'm just like kind of hesitant at this point. I'm not living with the Pettises anymore. I'm living with my other friend Tyler, and I'm living like in his basement and. It's like, I don't really have much else going for myself, but I was working at two other jobs. And I was pretty sure that I would make more money working the two other jobs than working these mentoring programs. Cause I know like they usually don't pay that much. So part of me is like, I'm about to lose money. I don't even know where, I don't even know what's around Rowan University. Like I'm gonna be living with these kids. I'm not like, I'm having these doubts, but I remember the biggest thing in my mind being, and the reason why I said yes, being that like, I'm real, I'll be able to really, make an impact in somebody's life. I'll really be able to do what I want to do. And even if it's only for a month, I'm going to, I'm like, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to do all I can to make sure that I leave a lasting imprint on their lives. And who knows if I'm able to connect with somebody and teach somebody something that will literally change their life. So I decided, I'm like, you know what? I'm not sure I have all these doubts and all these uncertainties and reasons why I don't know if I should, but I'm like, I'm going to do it. I'm like, yeah, I'll take, I like, I'll take the position. And she's like, okay, like we'll come, to, like Melissa is gonna come pick you up in an hour and a half from oh your house. Gosh, and I'm like, 
I'm just like, huh? Who's oh Melissa? <laughs> I'm thinking like, yo, who's Melissa, bro? <laughs> and she's like, well, she's um, she works with First Star Academy. Yeah. She's going to pick you up and you're going to be living there for a month. Just gather all your things and she'll be at your house in an hour and a half. In an hour and a half, this lady walks up to my door and says, hi, I'm Melissa. And I have a basket. And she's like, it's like, that's all you're bringing? I'm like, yeah, this is all my, <laughs> this is all my stuff. Like, literally, this is everything I have. Just a black a basket of clothes is like and like some like little personal items is all I had to my name. And she saw like where I was staying. I was staying downstairs in my friend's basement. And she kind of just like on the ride there, she kind of just talked to me about my life and just um, my story and getting to this point and how amazed of me she was. And I'm thinking like, what are you amazed at me by? Like she, she was amazed at you. I'm like, what do you, what do you, what are you amazed about? Like I have a, I have a basket of clothes to my name. I'm broke and I have. I don't I don't know where I'm going next in life. Okay, so on that drive towards Rowan, if you could give me just a crumb of whatever she said to you about on that same train of thought how amazed she was at you. Yeah. Tell me a little bit so, more. She was amazed at somebody in my situation. I'm living in my friend's um house in his basement with a basket of clothes. She was amazed that I would be willing to go and try to help somebody else. In most people's eyes, I'm somebody who needs help myself. In almost anybody's eyes, I would have been somebody who needs help myself. So to her, I was already a hero to these kids without, before I even seen them. Just the fact that I was able and willing to take my time to try to help somebody else in spite of everything that I was already dealing with. She's like, not a lot of people in your position are doing this and not a lot of people in your position would care that much to still try to try to fight for somebody else with all that you're battling with right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I never like I didn't really look at it that way. I kind of looked at it as like, I'm just going to do all I can for these kids. But and I didn't even really think about myself. I wasn't thinking about my personal circumstances. And when I thought about those who needed help, I never really considered myself like it was like, I'm just going to I'm like, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do it. When I started working with First Star, that's when Bob Carr had previously known me and Bob Carr runs a scholarship foundation called Give Something Back. He had previously known me and like my story a little bit, but I met him again during my time with First Star. Melissa and him um, knew each other very well. And one day he was giving full scholarships to all the First Star Academy students. And it was like a crazy experience. Like all these kids are getting full, full scholarships and everything. And come to find out, I had a full, I got a full scholarship as well. He wanted to, he wanted to make me a give back scholar as well. He heard about my story. He heard about all that I overcame and the fact that I was able to sacrifice my time and, and my, like my life for that, for that um, time period for these kids in spite of everything that I was going through. And he was amazed by that. And he offered me the same scholarship that all these kids received by this time the program's almost over it's a program that starts like late june through all of july so by the time it's almost over it's late july almost august that's that's what was supposed to be my freshman year so when he's telling me i have this full ride to college to any of these new jersey schools the first thing in my head i'm like there's no way i i haven't applied to any new jersey schools <laughs> my grades are horrible and school starts in a month it's all it's almost august School starts in September and you're telling me I have a full ride to any one of these schools. Part of me is like a little disbelief. Like, yeah, what are you telling me here? Like, is this a joke? And he's just like, he's just like, no, any, any one of these schools, like you have a full ride to, and I'm going to like, I'm going to, I'm going to make that happen for you. The first school that I go to, I, well, obviously I'm already at Rowan. So the first school that I kind of sit down and meet with somebody is Rowan University. And I met with um, Dean Jones at the time. And he told me from the first time he met me, he said, if you come to Rowan University, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that you graduate in four years. And anything that you need while you're here, you can come to me. Like, I, I'm not going to let you fail and I'm not going to let you waste your potential. Like, I see in you so much potential. I see in you a drive to want to do more and I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that everything you, that you want to do you're able to accomplish. And I'm just like, 
oh, like, that's crazy. Like, I'm thinking, like, this is the dean, like, telling me this. And then I go back to Wally. I'm telling him, like, yeah, um, I definitely think Rowan's a good option. I want to look at the other schools and everything. And then he tells me, he's like, yeah, like, I didn't even know my dean or president at my college. He's like, it's not very often that a dean of a school, like somebody in that high of a position of power, makes that kind of commitment to one student. To one There's guy, thousands yeah. of students. The fact that he's made that investment in your life, that's really something for you to consider. And, I, and after really thinking about it, I thought to myself and I'm thinking like, I don't think there's another school that's gonna do what Rowan is gonna do for me. As far as the connection that I had with First Start and it being there, as far as um, Dean Jones and his commitment to me, I'm like, why would I go anywhere else when they've already invested in my well-being and into my success? So I decided I was gonna go to Rowan University and from there, that's when um, the really the journey began of my career and my passion for really being a community activist and starting my own organization, starting numerous businesses and really beginning to thrive on my own. I think that was the start of me going from a kid that's like lost trying to figure it out to me becoming a man who was not only able to do for himself, but others as well. I want to transition to, from college, Ricardo, to Councilman Ricardo. How did that progression take place? So after college, I was working full time with my nonprofit organization, Free All Minds, and um, I really was, that was my main focus. And I saw another path that aligned with my overall purpose in life. And that's just service service to people and giving everybody an, an equal opportunity at life. And that's what I stand for as a person. That's what I stand for as a speaker. That's what I stand for in my nonprofit. And I saw a way to make that same impact politically as well. It's and I, oh, go ahead, and it never, it never really hit me until like later, like later into um, my summer after graduating college that that's another realm that I can get into and truly make an impact in people's lives. And there wasn't many people who came from where I came from, who came from poverty. There wasn't many people who were minorities that were in this field. And I felt as though there needed to be more representation of those people because in this country, a large, a large amount of minorities are oppressed and are, are without opportunity. And they deserve somebody who can be a voice for them. And I thought, why can't that be me? Gotcha. And I'm curious, what are your responsibilities? So as a, as a council member, um, right now I'm head of a community engagement. So my, my main role through that is basically creating a pipeline between the authority and the city and the community members. Is there an amount of influence that comes with just being the t the councilman like with that title have you noticed anyone treating you any differently um definitely like my peers you know they they see it and i think there's a um there's a lack of knowledge when it comes to um politics especially in the younger generation we're becoming a little bit more um knowledgeable in the field but a lot of people don't even know what a councilman is, what a councilman does. They're not really sure. So they just know like, oh snap, like he's like one of the people in the city. So it's definitely right. like a kind of um, a different look when it's like, oh snap, like you're with, you're with them, you're with the city, you're with the government. I'm technically a government official through, um, through the city. So it's definitely like, um, it definitely like people see you differently, probably more in like a higher status when it's like, I still view myself as like, you know, I'm no different than you. I'm just here trying to make as big of an impact as I can. Like, I don't think I get the position and I'm like, I think I'm th this big shot now. I think I just have more of abil an ability to make an impact now on, an, on a higher level. Do you want to go on into like further po politics and have even, even lengthier titles and go on to even be president one day? The only true, true goal is to have the impact over any title, over any recognition. 
the only thing that really matters is how many lives have you impacted? And you can do that as a president, or you could do that walking around your neighborhood and just being the guy that's always there for the young guys, young women in your neighborhood, regardless of your title. So although I do strive for these titles and these accomplishments with or without them, when it's all said and done, I'm still gonna have made impacts, an uh, impact in thousands of people's lives. Yes, and more power to you. I wanna know, how do people get in contact with you if they wanna be a part in helping you out with Free All Minds? And uh, how do they just reach out to you? Like, how do they, what's the best way to contact you to get involved with Free All Minds? And even if it's um, talking about things that concern Beverly. So the best way to um, contact me would probably be my email, um, rdell2016 at gmail.com. That would probably be the best way to contact me right now. Um, I'm also on Instagram at free all minds, free all minds underscore. Free all minds underscore is another way they, that they can contact me. And I wanna just close off with a little bit more details on like my, my nonprofit organization. So Free All Minds is a nonprofit organization for currently we're doing a, a mentoring program for young men that are going into the ninth grade. So I'm in the process right now of recruiting students for my mentoring program. It's gonna be an all year round academy where we're gonna be located in this building actually, my community center that I have here in Burlington City where we're gonna be teaching everything from life skills to academics to entrepreneurship and just really giving students a, a safe place to be and have fun and grow and giving them opportunities and exposure to different career fields. So if that's something that um, somebody who's watching this, if you know somebody who's a young man who's in the ninth grade, who's in the Burlington County area, this is an opportunity for them to, you know, really come out and be a part of something special. Not only to impact their lives, but to also be a part of the start of this amazing academy as well. So they can reach out to me as well if they're interested in that at rdale2016 at gmail.com. And thank you. Awesome. And now when we see you, my last question on the street, what do we call you? Do we just call you Councilman Dale or can we still call you Ricardo? They can still call me Ricardo. Like, uh, some people are like, oh, Councilman Dale, it's like, yeah, like it's, it's cool or whatever. But um, I'm fine with just, you know, Ricardo. Like I, it doesn't have to be like, you know, super like uppity kind of thing. I feel like I'm pretty like a laid back guy. <laughs>